give it one hour before I burst into flames. So let's get going. Ugh, it's 4,000 degrees, so if you all can hear the fan, I'm sorry, but there's just no way of conducting this video without it. So I'll just hopefully be able to do some good sound editing. Sarah of Pins Abigail on Instagram asked a little while ago for some guidance on how to best support Costubers. With the Costube Symposium coming up at the end of the summer, I think this is a great time to get all of you excited to support creators and hopefully discover some new ones. More about Cozy 2021 at the end of the video. How to care for your Costuber, a guide on supporting costuming creators. The Costuber, or Tubis Fabricare, is a rare but magnificent variety of internet content creator. Let's learn more about this elusive and exquisite force of nature. Characteristics within the species are varied and broad. They can include an overabundant fabric stash, seemingly random stockpiles of craft supplies, an encyclopedic knowledge of medieval sumptuary laws or armor construction, and most intriguingly, the ability to bend both time and space to accommodate upload schedules. There are no physical traits which can immediately be used to identify a costuber. Close examination may reveal calluses or minor abrasions from handling dangerous objects like heat guns, fabric shears, or number 10 needles. If you are lucky enough to catch the eye of a wild costuber, you may see a frantic gleam in the eye. This is due to the UFO pile, which is the secret shame of many of their kind. However, by far the simplest way that a costuber may be recognized is by their elaborate plumage and meticulous grooming rituals, which they proudly display as often as they can. Costubers are uniquely adept travelers in both time and places of existence. While they have been long known to occupy the interconnected tubes of the global internet, researchers have recently concluded that they also inhabit the physical realm. It is only through their shy personalities and immaculate camouflage that they were so long undetected. They have also demonstrated a startling ability to conduct paradox-free time travel. This revelation may have long-term implications in the field of quantum entanglement. Physically, costubers hail from all corners of the Earth, seemingly adaptable to many different climates. In the world of the internet, their provenance is just as vast, coming together from the worlds of reenactment, fashion design, cosplay, history, and literature, with several subspecies occupying overlapping areas of interest. They are truly a most versatile being. Costubers are very protective, frequently challenging outsiders' assertions that corsets were torture devices with sharp rebukes and academic sources. When ignorant myths about Renaissance bathing habits and women were just smaller back then appear in historical subreddits, they enjoy setting those threads on fire with facts and a healthy dose of debunking. Both sexes have a beard, but males display more frequently, especially in courtship rituals. We interrupt this educational segment to correct an error in tonight's broadcast. The aforementioned characteristic of the beard refers to the Pogona Viticeps, or bearded dragon. We at Lizcapism and Co. deeply regret our error and hope you will continue to be viewers of this program. Costumers are not suitable as pets, but there are many ways of caring for them in their natural habitat. Please consider using these techniques for any costumers in your life. Okay, I definitely can't keep up that gimmick forever. <laughs> so here is how you can properly care for the cause tubers that you enjoy. Not all cause tubers are trying to make a living at costuming on the internet, but making content for free is costly regardless, either in terms of money, time, or energy. So how can you support your cause tuber financially? Some of these will be more obvious than others, but they're all helpful. And if you can't afford to give financially, don't worry, there are way more free ways to support your costubers. We'll be getting to those in a moment. 
Ko-fi and Patreon are excellent ways to support your favorite cause tubers because they are ways of diversifying the income stream of the creator. If ad revenue is suddenly greatly reduced, or YouTube goes under, and there's all of a sudden a change-up of how online video works, or a video is inexplicably demonetized, a stream of income that isn't tied directly to YouTube could be the difference that keeps that cause tuber afloat. If you can't afford the tiers that are offered with a lot of Patreon pages, Patreon still allows you to pledge only a dollar a month. You can just select to not have a tier. You might not get all of the perks of the tiered memberships, but those are just icing on the cake of free content that you already love. And many creators will provide perks to all patrons, which includes all contributors no matter how small. As an example, if half of my subscribers pledged $1 per month, I would receive about as much in take-home pay after fees and taxes as my most recent full-time office job. It all adds up. Nothing is not enough to earn our gratitude and thanks. A quick thank you to my Patreon patrons and Kofi donors. This is such a perfect segue. Contributions from my Patreon are currently paying for many subscription fees to things like editing software, music libraries, and a few other ongoing expenses beyond the cost of making individual costumes. It's a huge boost and I'm so grateful for it. If you would like to contribute to my Patreon or my Kofi account, the links are below. Use their sponsor codes or affiliate links. When a costumer does a sponsorship promotion on their channel, they have been paid for that promotion. But the companies paying for the ad will be keeping track of those who use the sponsor codes or special URLs to see what kind of return they're getting for that advertising investment. The more the code or URL is used, the more likely that the company will continue to support that costumer and possibly others in the future. Affiliate links are another way of spending money you were planning to spend already, but now tossing a little percentage to the cause tuber who recommended the product to you. Buying their merch or patronizing their online stores. There's a lot of labor that goes into these in addition to the work of making videos and costumes. If you like them, buy them. And no matter how small you think a purchase it is, I guarantee you that the creator is secretly doing a happy dance with every new order. We know that not everyone can afford to pay money for this content. We put it up for free, and most of us want it to be enjoyed for free. So many of us have benefited from free content to learn these skills and connect with other creators. We will never ever begrudge a viewer who cannot give money. If you can't offer money, there are many ways that you can help us thrive as creators. Turn off your ad block. It's free, and the ad revenue is split between the creator and YouTube. If you can afford premium YouTube to get rid of those ads, that's cool, but don't feel pressured. The dollar value to the creator is not significantly different. If your costumer isn't monetized yet, try to get them there. Not all creators will talk about this, so you might not be able to tell. YouTube has opted to put some ads on non-monetized channels recently, so that's unfortunately not a guarantee. But here are the current requirements for monetization. 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours in a calendar year. The best thing that you can do for these not yet monetized cause tubers is to give them those watch hours and to subscribe. The second most important thing is to tell everyone else about them. Tell everyone about them and look up the people that other people tell you about. YouTube is pretty cagey about exactly which actions do what with the algorithm and video performance, and I'm sure that there are creators who can dive deeper into this for you, but here's the most basic concept. YouTube, like most social media, trades in the attention economy, meaning that the product they offer is human attention for advertisements. One of the major goals of YouTube, therefore, is to keep viewers on the site and to provide them with content that they will enjoy so they keep keeping on the site. So a completely free thing you can do with the videos of your favorite creators is actively using the platform. Try to think of all of the engagement from the point of view of YouTube, who is hoping you will stay on the website. If you write a comment, click the like button, add a video to a playlist or your queue, if you click on a recommended or related video, or use the cards in the video, these are all tiny bits of information that tell YouTube that this video is being viewed, but more importantly, it is being viewed by viewers who aren't passively consuming the content, or immediately leaving the site afterwards. A good example of passive YouTube consumption is watching a tutorial video that popped up in a Google search, and then immediately closing that browser window once you've got the info you need. Not a bad thing, but not the kind of engagement YouTube gets excited about. So be mindful of your interactions with YouTube. It can help us find bigger audiences and get more viewers. 
Here's another convenient segue for me to ask you if you could please subscribe, like, and share this video and leave a comment if any of it was helpful. Social media. This includes giving your social media support by sharing videos, but also engaging with the creator's social media posts generally, which may help folks discover them through these platforms. Understanding the parasocial relationship and its limitations. When it comes to Cosetubers, you are not their friend. You are a fan. This is really important to know. The creator is friendly and welcoming. They make you laugh. You know their dog's name and where they went to university. But they are an entertainer, a teacher, a content creator, but not a friend. They don't owe you a response to positive or negative comments. They aren't obliged to interact with you at all beyond the boundaries they have set on their social media and channel. Please respect that and recognize that in all of your interactions with them and others. Positivity and support in the comments. I don't know a single person on YouTube who doesn't love getting positive comments. We're making this stuff public. It's for you in many ways. We love to hear that you liked it. It's a huge boost to our confidence when we see these messages. A minor caution. Really emphatic positivity can be a little unsettling. See the point above about parasocial relationships. We're happy you enjoyed it, but sometimes positivity can come off a little intense. Ask yourself if you would say this out loud to a random person on the street that you didn't know anything about. That isn't to say that we don't like the positivity, but just be aware of its context for the receiver. Answering creator questions or polls honestly and generously. When creators ask questions in the community tab, in their videos, Instagram stories, or etc., we actually want the answers. We might still go our own way because it's our platform, but these answers are often extremely valuable to our planned content now and in the future. But please be gentle. If you don't want to see something we asked about, just answer no. If you're asked for reasons or want to provide them, try to remember that they may have been really committed to this idea or thought it would be better received. The exception here is when their ideas will cause harm, racism, homophobia, cultural appropriation. Use your judgment. Okay, this next one is a mouthful, but it's important. Actively and verbally prioritizing the creator's well-being before frequent content releases. It's not enough to think that your favorite creators deserve a break or to assume that they will take them. There are no bank holidays on the internet. Chances are content creators that you follow, unless they have said otherwise, are working weekends, holidays, evenings, maybe not all of the time, but definitely some of the time. So when your creators post things like, I'm thinking of taking a break, or no video this week, or sorry, video's gonna be late, be proactive in telling us that you don't care. Intellectually, we know it's not the end of the world, but we are human beings with insecurities, and sometimes we need a little reassurance. Jokes in the comments about more videos, please, can be a little stressful. We're really flattered, but for many of us, this joke comes a little too close to our own insecurities about content output. Again, on an intellectual level, we know you're probably exaggerating, but if you spend too much time on the internet, you lose all ability to tell the difference between lighthearted jokes and genuine breaches of boundaries, reporting harassment, abuse, and cruelty in the comments or in live stream chats. I have protection filters turned up pretty high on my YouTube comments, and I'm a white person, so the degree to which I get harassed personally is laughably small in the grand scheme of YouTube. But boy howdy have I gotten some weird ones in the past. For some people, keeping on top of hateful comments feels like a full-time job. Luckily, bullying and hate speech from strangers on the internet is basically the only thing that doesn't compromise my very fragile ego. But even for people like me who aren't bothered by it, it's still exhausting to deal with. This goes double and treble for folks who are BIPOC, visibly disabled, queer, or part of other minority groups. So if it's rude, downvote those comments. If they hit the realm of bullying, hate speech, or abuse, report it. Things that can feel like support, but are not. Aggressive standing. You know what I love about the internet is that that definition is from Merriam-Webster. <laughs> Okay, so remember when I said that positive enthusiasm can be overwhelming? Oftentimes it can lead to some of the following uncomfortable behavior. Aggressive attacking of those who dislike the creator's content. If you end up on a Facebook group or a Twitter feed that is expressing dislike or indifference to a favorite creator, leave it alone. 
seriously. As long as it's not hate speech, inciting violence, or other things that fall into the category of seriously that's not cool, just ignore it. Don't send a screenshot or a link of that threat or message to the creator. We don't need to see that shit. If they didn't tag us, or if it's a private group, it's not our business. They are entitled to their opinion, and showing it to us feels much more hostile than the person who's just doing something on their own, in their own little sandbox. Maybe send the creator a little love instead, unrelated to the post in question. A positive comment or tagging us on Instagram. Starting shit, when your favorite creator is publicly called out. Being a fan of someone isn't the same as knowing them personally, as we've established. That means that you don't know what's in their head, Chances are you don't know half of what's going on in a given situation. It is not your job to jump to their defense in this situation. All of your favorite content creators have fucked up and hurt someone, whether privately or publicly, in interpersonal ways or in broader, much general ways, including me. Whether it was thought, word, deed, or inaction, every single one. So while I cannot speak for all Causetubers or other content creators, the thing that I am relying on you for is call me out on my shit. Standing up and throwing the internet equivalent of a temper tantrum because someone is bullying someone you don't know personally for something you don't have any experience with is weird. Take a deep breath. Take stock of the situation. Do the bare minimum of mental work of imagining that the person or people doing the calling out are onto something. Reflect on it. If, at the end of your reflection, you agree that the actions of the creator were wrong, even if you weren't an injured party, then the best thing that you can do as a fan and supporter is to tell that creator that you agree with the people calling them out. You don't have to be cruel, you don't have to unsubscribe, but voicing your disappointment and your wish that they improve is important. Look for the creator to change their actions, not just their words. I have seen way too many tearful YouTube apologies which led to nothing at all. Beware, especially of white women's tears. I am now speaking directly to and about my fellow white women creators. Listen up, ladies. White women have intentionally and unintentionally weaponized their tears and emotions as a way to change the subject and change the nature of their role in the discourse. Even if you didn't mean to do it, you have been socialized that crying is a sign of vulnerability and you are secretly hoping that crying, however genuine, will make people treat you less harshly. Folks, we make videos and edit them for, if not a living, at least a minor stipend. We are fully capable of waiting until we have a calm moment to film ourselves and get a clean edit of our good takes, if we so choose. If our emotions are still too raw when an apology is called for, and real regret can be an intense emotional experience, we can, and will, find another way to express ourselves. In writing, for instance. Okay, <laughs> things got a little dour there for a moment, so let's round this video out with some positivity. The Costume Symposium is coming up at the end of the summer. There are already so many videos lined up for this event, as well as live panels, Instagram events, attendee Discord servers, and a bunch more. Follow along with the announcements at the Instagram handle linked below for all of the info as it comes up. It's going to be fantastic, and I really hope that you are able to discover all kinds of new creators to support in the ways that I've outlined in this video. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Have a really great week, and I'll see you soon.